Uh, first uh, 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less than that, will be our annual general meeting. And then followed by that, we have a, a special presentation by Jeremy Kazub on his uh, Aurora camera. And uh, we have a ton of observations tonight. So hang in there and we're going to get things underway. So next slide, please, Chris. A couple of uh, security things here, just to remind you that uh, please do not click on any links that might appear in the chat or Q&A windows. They could be some nefarious people trying to point you in the wrong direction. So uh, if you need to ask a question or uh, to the panelists, or there's a question when it comes to the annual general meeting about any particular motion, please use the Q&A uh, window, not, not the chat window for that. Okay, next one. So here's tonight's program. I'm almost done my introduction. And I'm going to turn it over to over to our chief here, Stephen Norris, who will uh, take us through the AGM. Uh, after that, Ottawa skies for December, and then Jeremy is going to be talking about his self-contained Aurora camera of a break, followed by observation, observation challenges, and announcements. So, thank you for coming out here tonight, folks. And I'm going to uh, highlight uh, Stephen here because uh, he's going to be in charge for the next little while. There we go. Yes, good evening, everyone. I will, I will try and move this through. Uh, I know this isn't uh, a lot of people's favorite part of our, uh, of our meeting programs, but unfortunately, it's a very necessary one. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, there will be a uh, Zoom uh, uh, poll coming up uh, very shortly, uh, administered by Chris Tarrant. Uh, this is needed to establish quorum. Uh, so what we need to do is uh, on that Zoom poll, uh, let us know if you are an RASC Ottawa Centre member. So if you could quickly do that, uh, that will allow us to, uh, to proceed. Chris, you'll have to add the panelists into this because we don't get the poll. Correct. And um, while not everyone has answered yet, we far exceed quorum already. Yeah, I would say, I think once we get the quorum, we can uh, move on. <clears throat> For yeah, the yeah. remainder of the uh, uh, annual general meeting, uh, we'll be kind of going by what's turned into a, a normal Zoom protocol on voting. In other words, we're talking negative responses. So uh, when we do a vote, uh, in the absence of uh, nobody uh, indicating uh, either in the Q&A session that they are in opposition, uh, we will assume that, uh, that people have voted positively. It's just much easier to, uh, to keep a whole uh, tally of things by doing it that way. Um, also, um, when we get to items uh, where people need to propose any additional agenda items or changes, uh, please use the Q&A to, uh, to respond and propose uh, or wait until the, uh, the other business at the end. Um, during the AGM, all mics are uh, going to be muted. Uh, however, if you do need to ask a question, uh, please use the Q&A. And if you include the fact in that Q&A that you desire to also speak to the question, include that in your Q&A remark. Uh, we do have the ability to turn the mic on for any individual person, even in this webinar environment. However, we have to know that you would like to speak. Okay, moving along, adoption of the agenda. Uh, we need someone to move for the adoption. Do we have anyone? Uh, Dave Chisholm, 
I see, and a seconder, uh, Gordon Webster. So again, looking at our normal uh, Zoom protocol, uh, are there any objectors to uh, adopting this motion? And hearing and seeing none, Chris? I, I see none. All right. We, let's move along. The minutes of last year's meeting uh, were recently circulated, uh, trying to make sure everybody had a, a um, opportunity to read them. Um, if there are no questions or comments, I would uh, be looking for a motion to adopt. Uh, Andrea. Andrea. Yes, I move to adopt. And seconder. I'll second that, Richard Taylor. Okay, thank you. And once again, uh, anyone uh, a negative vote? So uh, we'll give people a chance to. Uh, to respond if they so wish. I don't see anything, Chris, do you? No, there is no Q&A. Okay. Uh, the President's Report is yet next. Uh, however, before we get into the President's Report, um, I don't know any, whether anyone uh, has seen the latest reports out of SETI. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, they've actually uh, managed to decode a message back to us, and uh, it's very surprising. And on that note, we'll move into the president's report. Assuming the presidency in the middle of a pandemic has brought its own unique set of challenges to the position and to the center. Fortunately, I've had the help and support of a fabulous team of volunteers. Here, I'm not only talking about my fellow council members and the named volunteers in various appointed positions, but everyone who has rolled up their sleeve and pitched in in so many ways. Naming everyone would simply take too long, and I know I would be sure to overlook someone if I tried. So instead, please simply accept my gratitude. I continue to be amazed at the talented individuals within our center, not only with the stunning quality of the astronomical images, but in so many other ways. Some members are regular contributors to citizen science initiatives, providing valuable data to the research community. Others are designing and building their own astronomical equipment, circuitry, programs. There are several home remote observatories in the area. Members' knowledge is readily available, evident, in the talks given and the advice freely provided in the email exchanges, both of which make our astronomical community stronger. We are fortunate as well to be in good financial shape, which has enabled us to continue improving how we serve our members. The two main areas here are at the Fred Lossing Observatory, FLO, and our website, both of which I will touch on later in this report. Ongoing COVID-19 restrictions required us to continue having our monthly meetings virtually. Thankfully, our meeting chair, Dave Chisholm, and Chris Tarrant on the technical side have got the process down pat and the operation is running smoothly over Zoom. A big thank you to Rask National for the use of their Zoom account for the hosting. 
Our initial high numbers of virtual participants has settled back though, and we are now holding steadily at roughly pre-COVID-19 levels, a likely result of Zoom fatigue and the desire once again to have physical meetings with the additional interaction attendant with them. Also flourishing despite the pandemic is our monthly newsletter, Astronauts. Our editor, Gordon Webster, somehow manages to source an ever increasing number of interesting articles and keep things fresh. Similarly, COVID-19 restrictions scuttled our annual dinner meeting for the second year and has forced continued cancellation of our very popular public star parties. We remain hopeful that when the warmer weather returns in 2022, so can they. With vaccination numbers increasing and the easing of some restrictions, we have had some distance member star parties at FLO in the latter part of the year. That's of course, when the weather also cooperates. Despite the restrictions, Dave Chisholm has continued with his remarkable virtual outreach program, enhancing the lives of over 270 youth and 30 adults this year. Speaking of FLO, 2021 marked the 50th anniversary of its establishment, an event celebrated on September the 11th with a get together by over 75 people. The main architects of this great event were Gordon Webster and Rick Scholes, although as usual, they had a lot of assistance. Music, telescope clinics, sketching workshops, observatory tours, conversation and equipment demonstrations filled the day. All topped off with a barbecue and of course, cake. The good news being the rain held off. The bad news being things ended up earlier than hoped as the cloudy skies did not allow for viewing that night. Nevertheless, a great event was had by all. Did I mention there was cake? The original Fred Lossing 16 inch telescope also turned 50 years old this year. Although retired from service at FLO in 2017, it has now found new life at the North Frontenac Dark Sky site. Provided by the Ottawa Centre on permanent loan to the township of North Frontenac, it has been lovingly restored by them and installed in a new purpose-built observatory at the site. Public first light was at a ceremony there on August the 14th which I was fortunate enough to attend, along with a few other Ottawa Centre members, especially as there was, you guessed it, cake. <laughs> Continuing with the FLO theme, thanks to our observatory director, Rick Scholes, and a host of volunteers, it has had another exceptional year of maintenance, upgrades, and installations. The entrance road has never been so good after the brushing and additional gravel work. The issues with the Paul Commission telescope systems have been resolved, and the Rolf Meyer telescope is happily installed in its relocated observatory. There are new side guides on the Mike Worth telescope's roll off roof, new electrical panel in place, power to the Paul Commission telescope and the Rolf Meyer telescope and the observing mounds have been expanded and improved. And that's just the major items. Looking to make a decision on heading out to FLO for some observing? Well, there's a new aid to help you out. Head over to Andre Paquette's website. There you'll find he is now displaying the output from his personal weather station located less than one kilometer away. Also conveniently on the same site page is the FLO Clear Sky Thought. Thank you, Attila Danko, and current satellite imagery, giving you all the decision-making tools you need 
in one convenient location. Sadly, in this report, I also have to mention the passing of three members since the last president's report. Thomas Ray, Michael James, and Paul Shepard. They will be missed. The Ottawa Centre has been taking an active role in ensuring the former Dominion Observatory on Carling Avenue here in Ottawa suffers as minimal impact as possible from the proposed new Ottawa General Hospital campus being constructed adjacent to it. A dedicated group of volunteers has done tremendous work in documenting the history of the Dominion Observatory, attending planning meetings, lobbying politicians, making applications for historical designations, along with other efforts. I am pleased to say that at this time, it appears that things are looking positive, although as usual, some work remains to bring things to a conclusion. I would like to thank Mick Wilson for the tremendous effort put into the center website. If you've not been on it lately, I encourage you to take a look. The breadth and depth of the content available on it is truly amazing. Equally amazing to me is the way that it is indexed, cross-referenced, and searchable. I still don't have a full grasp of all of what it is capable of, and I urge you to check it out yourself. A few years back, the wheels were put in motion to give special recognition to the many years Brian McCullough has given the Ottawa Center astronomy education, and public outreach. It was with great satisfaction this year that we finally saw him honored with an asteroid named after him. Somewhere out in the main asteroid belt lies asteroid 10059 McCullough, 1988 FS2. I look forward to seeing the first image of it to be shown in our monthly meeting observations. Way back when we were able to have in-person meetings, a fixture of the meetings was the coffee, drinks, and treats served up by Art and Ann Fraser at their conclusion. There was never a time I could not remember them being there. Turns out, that would be because they've been doing it for 40 years. They have now decided that it's time to step away from the coffee pot and let someone else continue the tradition. They will forever be one of my fond memories. And on that note, I will conclude my president's report with a tip of the hat to Art and Anne and a hearty thank you to them for all that they have done over the years and continue to do for the center. In person, there would have been cake. Thank you. Now, everybody's probably getting very tired of listening to me, but unfortunately, our uh, president, David Parfait, uh, sure. had to resign earlier this year due to a conflict with his new job. So I will also be uh, presenting the financial statements for the year ended September the 30th, 2021. The figures here uh, that we'll be presenting, oh, hang on, back up, I got out of order. First thing, according to Tris, who is always keeping me honest, is the 2019-2020 Auditor's Report, which I will let everybody uh, read for a moment.
Okay. So that was the auditor's report. The numbers we're presenting here. Oh, oh okay. The, the numbers that we are presenting here is a summary uh, report of the uh, financial statements for the 19 2021 season or fiscal year. Um, if anybody desires a copy of the full report, uh, please contact the secretary and you will, of course, be provided with a uh, with a full copy, detailed copy of the report. So, as of September 30, 2021, our total revenue was 12,756. The cost of goods sold, 2,790. Our operating costs were 9,593, resulting in a net income, including depreciation, of $372. Depreciation itself was $4,146. So our net income, not including depreciation, was 4,518. Next slide, please, Chris. We started out the beginning of the year with total assets, uh, liabilities and equity, of 87,918. Now, our current assets stand at 68,970, capital assets 21,700, for a total assets of $90,670. Our current liabilities are at 2,380, our retained earnings, 88,290. So we finish the year our, with our total liabilities and equity of 90,670. Next slide. Uh, Stephen, there is a question for you here from Gordon Dewis. What is being depreciated? Depreciation is on uh, FLO. Uh, the um, and our uh, loan library, our telescope loan library, and uh, some telescope equipment as well. Um, again, uh, if you wish a copy of oh, and and if. Uh, Thanks, Gordon. And again, if you wish, uh, we can send you a copy of the full uh, financial report, which breaks that uh, down fully. Uh, we do have a restricted fund. Uh, we set this up at the beginning of the pandemic to potentially assist members who may have had financial difficulty in renewing. Um, we have had, uh, uh, as you can see, very minor amount of, of usage uh, from that fund. However, we've, we've kept it in place uh, it, just in case uh, anybody else uh, shows up who, uh, who needs some assistance. The center uh, has, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, no issues with ongoing financial viability. 
Uh, we um, our, our funds are good. We are meeting our uh, obligation under uh, uh, a CRA charitable organization. And uh, our filings are up to date at this time. And with that, I'll, uh, are there any further questions? If not, uh, I'd like to see about a motion to approve the 19 or the 2020 21 uh, financial we statement. We have a, a motion see. to approve from uh, Gordon Deuce. Thank you, Gordon. And a seconder. Uh, I see. I see Gordon Webster. Yep. I see his big hand. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and once again, our negative Zoom vote. We'll just wait for a moment to see if there are any uh, objections. Uh, I would say not, so we can continue on. Paul Sadler, who carried out our audit uh, last year has um, agreed to continue in that role. So I need a motion to appoint Paul as the 2021-22 auditor. I see Dave, Dave Chisholm. Chisholm. And I see Andrea as a second. Second there. And once again, we'll wait a moment to see if there's any negative votes. Being so, let's move on. We're now moving into the election of officers, councillors, national council reps, and the meeting chair. Normally, this function would be done by uh, Mike Mogadon. Uh, unfortunately, Mike is not available. He's out in Calgary. Uh, so you're, once again, stuck with me. So here is the, but Mike did put together a very good slate of individuals. So here is the proposed slate of uh, executive and council members. Stephen, if I can intervene for a second and admit an error on this slide, you can talk to, and that's in the National Council of Reps. Yes. Unfortunately, at the last minute, um, Paul Sadler, for personal reasons, has had to step aside from the National Council Rep. Uh, he was uh, going to be in year two of his two-year term. Uh, he's been doing an absolutely wonderful job for us, but um, as happens so many times, life happens, and uh, he will not be able to do it. So we do have an opening for a second national council rep. Uh, so if anybody is interested, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, fortunately, we will have some representation as Mick Wilson has, uh, has agreed to stand for our second position or now our first. So uh, yeah, uh, a thank you, big thank you to Paul though. And because there are no conflicts in here, we, it's a claim. So we get to move on. There are a number of council uh, appointed positions. Um, the, uh, this, once again, the uh, Mike put together a slate. Uh, we do have the hospitality position the previously held by Art and Anne uh, Open. Um, Hopefully we will need it very soon, but uh, probably not until a good way into 2022, I'm afraid. So this is your, your slate here. And now you get a break from me as we'll switch over to Dave Chisholm to talk to some of the awards. Okay, folks. So it's with the, uh, Great pleasure 
that I announce who the 2021 Paul Commission Observer of the Year Award is. I had a number of submissions. It was a difficult choice. And so, Chris, can you reveal the winner of this award? It is Rick Wagner. Congratulations, Rick. Excellent uh, log there. Very, very detailed. Uh, there's the picture of the plaque that you will get eventually. The Rolf Meyer Award for Planetary Observing. This one was a, a fairly easy choice because this individual does some amazing planetary observ observations. And um, it was the same person as last year, and that is Taras. So congratulations, Taras. Best presentation of the year. Who could this be? Chris, it's Pierre Martin for his 2020 and 2021 meteors. It was over at, he did one in January, one in March. It was an excellent presentation. So congratulations there. And I've added an image of the year award uh, with the council's permission because I, I, I felt that we, we, we get so many wonderful images from everybody. And uh, there was one outstanding image, and congratulations to Andrea for her Squid Nebula. That was a, an amazing image, and that, that's what you will eventually be getting. And okay, All right. and there's the, there's the image itself. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Gordon Webster here. Just have to find him. There he is. And uh, I'll replace the spotlight. There you go, Gordon. Thanks, Dave. Um, every year this time, I have the privilege of reviewing uh, the past article, the articles from the past year, and selecting what I feel is an outstanding article. In the past years, I've selected based on uh, scholarship, research, uh, scientific value, the value to our center, and perhaps the quality of the writing. This year, I've, the selection is based on, on most of those criteria, but also on sheer volume. It should come as no surprise that I've selected Rick Skulls for his year-long series on the FLO and the history of the FLO. Rick's series is it's very readable. Uh, the articles have, have created an incredibly valuable resource for our center uh, documenting the history, the 50-year history of the FLO. Thank you, Rick, and congratulations. Also, while we're on the topic of the 50th anniversary, we had the observing challenge list that went out and we did have some response to it. And uh, the first submission, um, sorry, we had several responses um, and, and from those responses, we drew uh, a name and that person will be awarded uh, one of the FLO hoodies. And the name drawn was Richard Taylor, who was also the first to finish the, the challenge list. Thank you and congratulations, Richard. Okay, just a second here. I'm gonna turn it back to our president here. Just give me a second and see if there's any other business that we need to cover off tonight. There we go. Okay. Um, just a quick note uh, before I do make the call for other business. Uh, those, uh, that slate of appointed positions, um, they will be confirmed by council at our uh, next meeting. But I'd like to just quickly talk about council meetings. Um, something that may, people may not realize is uh, Ottawa Centre Council meetings are completely open to any members. So if you have an interest in council, uh, what's going on at council, uh, perhaps, have an interest in becoming a counselor, but want to <laughs> know a little bit more about what goes on before you uh, dive into the waters, the, the meetings are open. Now, 
Obviously, they're virtual uh, right now, uh, but you're more than welcome to join by Zoom. Uh, dates uh, for the net meetings will be sent out to the um, uh, membership via the, uh, the email group. And all you'll need to do if you wish to join is send a, a notice to the secretary and we'll be sure to have you in. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not long. We do try and limit them to a couple of hours. Uh, and it would be great uh, if you have any interest at all at becoming more involved in uh, that aspect of the, uh, the center. Uh, we'd love to see you there. And with that, I'll just make a call. Is, is there any other business? And then we can move on from the AGM. There are no open questions, Stephen. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for bearing with us. So, uh, I move adjournment. OK. That's all that's needed, isn't it, Chris? Sounds good. All righty. And gone. Okay, we're now back into the uh, the regular part of our meeting. So we welcome a bunch of new members, and we've had sixty new members in twenty twenty one, which is which is amazing. So uh, thank you, everybody who has joined us this uh, this last year. We do have a number of members that have been in the news recently. So Chris, we'll get the next first slide here. First of all, the International Dark Sky Association uh, uh, presented an award to uh, Robert Dick from our Ottawa Centre here. And it's the uh, Dr. Arthur Hogue and William T. Robinson Awards. Congratulations, Robert, for that well-deserved award. I don't know, uh, you may have heard uh, Brian on uh, CBC and All a Day with Alan Neal. You can always go back and listen to his interview, but uh, this was regarding the uh, asteroid that was named after him. So congratulations there, Brian. We had great coverage on CBC with Marcus Leach and his new setup on uh, Robert Dick's property and uh, some great coverage there. There was some video taken as well. So congratulations to Marcus. He's actually going to be giving us an update at our February meeting uh, on what, what's happening there. And uh, here, we, here we have um, some more on the... Uh, that this is on is this uh chris the ctv or this is rogers tv where gary was interviewed about the upcoming oh Earth okay season. okay sorry oh yeah there it is rogers so uh, congratulations there gary okay we'll go quickly through the ottawa skies for what's happening in december so here's where we are today. Tomorrow's gonna to be the new moon. We have a private uh, uh, members only party out at Flow tomorrow night. If the uh, clouds allow us to do that, it'd be a perfect night for viewing that. The full moon is on the uh, 19th. Shortest day of the year is on the uh, 21st. We have the Gemini's meteor shower, December 13th and 14th. That's one of the larger ones of the year. So uh, hopefully uh, you get out and see that. They're just sort of up and to the left of Orion. Unfortunately, uh, the moon phases, uh, moon's almost uh, three quarters full at that point. So it'll be a bit of a challenge. We have the Ursids meteor shower on December 21st and 22nd. It's a smaller minor meteor shower. And we have the Quantrids meteor shower, January 3rd and 4th. This is before our next meeting, so I thought I'd mention that again. It's a, it's a minor meteor shower. In terms of the sunrise of the set, uh, by the time we get to December 30th, the days are going to, uh, they're getting longer again. We're moving towards the shortest day of the year. And uh, yeah, this is sunrise, sunset times. Mercury is rising and setting with the sun, so it's not visible at this point. Venus is visible in the early evening. Look at around five o'clock right now. You can very easily see it. Mars is now becoming visible just before sunrise. Jupiter is visible in the evening. 
right through the month. Saturn is also visible in the evening, although it's uh, setting earlier and earlier. Uranus is visible evening and through the night, and Neptune is visible in the evening. There is our cartoon of the month. Sorry, I had to so, uh, throw something in there with a bit of a Christmas theme. Okay, next slide. So I continue to do uh, virtual interactive introductions to astronomy. I did one last week with the scout troop. I've, I'm doing a grade six class this week. Uh, if you know of any kids or even adult groups would like a intro to astronomy uh, Zoom presentation, uh, just to reach out to me. And um, the meeting chair at ottawa.resc.ca is uh, going to be going to mix. So, Mick, if you get these, uh, forward them to me, and we'll we'll create a new slide for the next meeting with my real email address. I also, I have a follow-on presentation to that. Both both these presentations are about an hour and fifteen minutes long. So it was with great pleasure that I turned the meeting over to Jeremy, who's going to be talking about a self-contained Aurora camera. Jeremy's going to be sharing his own slides, hopefully. So we're going to stop. There we go. So Jeremy, away you go. Thanks, Dave. I'm just going to press the share button and see if I can get this working. Good, and Dave, can you see the first slide of my presentation? Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I took me a second to highlight you, but you are highlighted now, so you're good to go. Okay, good, good. Uh, thanks for your time. And my presentation today is, uh, is uh, about an auroral imaging camera. So, so my, my passion, my focus, uh, in terms of looking up at the night sky is, is the Aurora. For the last three years, I've been pursuing that. Um, I've also been a member of Ottawa Centre for about three years. Uh, Aurora is a project, or the name of the project I've created uh, around this idea of having a, a, a sort of a autonomous camera that can uh, come with me and, and do photography while I'm doing my own photography. It's the idea of trying to be in two places at once or do two things at once. And since it's really hard to run two cameras at once, I thought I'd work on something that was uh, a bit more autonomous. So I'll go through that today and, and how it fits into the idea of, of citizen science, which is a big focus of everything uh, that astronomy is about. I just want to say thank you for the past year to the officers, councillors, volunteers, the, the National Council representatives, uh, our center's meeting chair, and, and just to the membership that have really brought the universe to so many people. Uh, it, it's that idea of sharing that's, that's so key and so important. The sky belongs to everybody, but the interpretation of what's visible, what's invisible, and, and making it understandable is just a skill and a talent and a passion that I, I really respect in, in everybody that pursues that. Uh, about two years ago, I started a project that I called Capture North, which was a citizen science project to, to really go out and explore the Northern Lights throughout uh, places like Northern Canada, like Iceland, like Norway, uh, and, and also to understand them from a scientific perspective for myself and to share that information through articles on the Capture North website and to try and leverage some of my background as, as a systems and computer engineer. Uh, could I write software that helps out? Could I understand the camera systems better? Uh, you can see there's a picture at along the, the famous Ingram Trail near Yellowknife uh, at Prosperous Lake. It's one of the the, the more well-known places for tourists to go and get photos in, in the Yellowknife area. But there's many hidden spots, there's many public spots, and Aurora chasing is a passion shared by many people across Canada, uh, Northern United States, Norway, Iceland, and other places. It's a tight-knit community, and it's, it's one with its own uh, interesting approach to software, to technology, and to the art and science of luck. Uh, there's some key components, uh, uh, kind of a, a four part component to any sort of observation. And, and I just want to list them here to frame how I'm going to give this presentation about this equipment. Really, 
as with any observation of the sky, step one is is the travel aspect, and you're you're really going someplace dark. You're getting out from under clouds. Uh, you're you're going where the where you can see what you want to see. Uh, there's the element with the sledgehammer, of course, adjustment. Uh, sometimes building your own hardware, building your own systems, getting things aligned is just a, a brute force operation. Lots of heavy lifting, lots of just getting things done. Uh, but there's also the the opposite of that, or the complement to that, which is the fine tuning, getting all of your uh, stuff working just right down to the down to the fine tuning of calibration. And finally, there's the software that sort of uh, brings it all together once you've got your image data. Think, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to fix it in software, store it on hard drives. What's its final destination and how am I going to present it and share it? So today, I just want to go over five elements of, of this Aurora camera and how it fits into citizen science and how it fits into the idea of, of what it's like to say, I'm going to create an instrument that solves a problem that I've seen and that I want to address. Uh, so let's get started on that. So first, we'd probably want to review the Aurora Borealis, the Aurora Australis. Where are they and what are they? Uh, I was fortunate to do a presentation in April of 2020. I think it was our first Zoom presentation, actually. And, and Chris and Dave did an excellent job uh, ramping up on that technology. And one of the presentations was I had the opportunity to present a year of Aurora chasing, which was my first year of really uh, going out and photographing the Aurora. And you can find it at the YouTube address there. Uh, that really has more of a background into what creates the Aurora, the, the science behind it as far as it's understood, and what, it's, what kind of equipment you need uh, and background knowledge you need to capture Aurora imagery. So I'd encourage you to uh, watch that video for a more in-depth view of of the aurora. Uh, a lot of people think of the aurora as someplace up north, but this is a photo from New Edinburgh, actually just a couple kilometers from, uh, from the Aviation Museum where we uh, formerly had our meetings. And as you can see in the upper left, uh, there's a lot of light pollution in downtown Ottawa. But if you do some light pollution sort of uh, subtraction, I guess, or differentiation. You can see the aurora up north, uh, including the green at 558 nanometer wavelength, and above it, the oxygen emissions that are red. So even in downtown Ottawa, if there's enough of a geomagnetic storm, in this case on November 4th, the big storm you might have heard about in the news, which is classified as a, a G3 storm by, by the uh, space weather scale, uh, you will be able to see it from places like Ottawa, as far south as Ottawa. Now, the aurora start at the sun. And just very briefly, there's two, there's two phenomena on the sun or that, that interact with the Earth from the sun that create the aurora. The first is coronal holes, which can be seen as sort of dark spots at certain emission uh, lines. And these create high-speed solar wind uh, that, that's going out all along the, the, the solar system. But that high-speed wind has got energy in it, and that can energize the Earth's magnetosphere and create aurora. So that can be over 400 kilometers per second. A, a typical solar wind uh, is around 300. Then there's the coronal mass ejections, which are sort of more dramatic, the ones that you, you see in a, in a lot of dramatic uh, time lapses of solar activity. This is when um, a mass is actually ejected from the sun and it can impact Earth. It can spread out and, and impact Earth. This creates shock wave patterns in the existing solar wind. Uh, it'll increase solar wind density and there may be high speed solar wind uh, behind it, but they're less predictable, but they can cause dramatic results. And that's what happened in uh, on November 4th. So two phenomena from the sun that will energize Earth's magnetosphere and cause uh, auroral displays. And the sun and the Earth are, are really joined magnetically. That solar wind, when it impacts Earth's magnetosphere, it 
it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, that magnetosphere, and couples with it if the magnetic polarity is, is right for coupling. That squeezes the magnetotail and it reconnects, and that reconnection accelerates uh, electrons and protons back into the night side of the north and south auroral zones, which look like sort of donuts around the top and bottom of Earth. And that's why you see the aurora on the night side of Earth and not the day side facing the sun. And you can see those auroral ovals here on the uh, NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center auroral forecast. These are, uh, these are both the, the, the north geomagnetic pole and the south geomagnetic pole. And you can see that extra energization or that extra energy is on the night side uh, and less on the day side. So it's not just because it's dark. Uh, it's actually, that's where the energy is is pouring in is on the night side from that magnetotail behind the earth. And these are probabilistic models. Um, this isn't actually a satellite image. There aren't many satellites that can get good images of Aurora. There have been in the past, but that's not a priority for a lot of uh, imaging systems. So this is uh, synthesized through passes of satellites through that area that extrapolate from a linear sample into these sort of probability donuts. And you can see they almost never reach down to Ottawa, but they very often reach uh, the Northern Prairies and of course up into the Yukon and Northern Manitoba uh, and, and Northwest Territories. The aurora are an emission of the Earth's atmosphere that take place from 80 to 400 kilometers up. This, this high speeds uh, electrons and protons impact molecular and ionized atomic oxygen and nitrogen. And those are the dominant sources of the colors that we see. Uh, so it is an emission spectra predominantly at 558 nanometers from atomic oxygen. That's also because our eyes are most sensitive to those, those uh, wavelengths, but also ionized molecular nitrogen and also the red aurora that are commonly seen with uh, coronal mass ejections. Those are due to slower speed, but higher volume of, of particles impacting higher up in the atmosphere and that excites oxygen emissions, which are more red. So often you'll see green and red and then a little bit of purple at the bottom fringe from high speed electrons that penetrate all the way down to 80 kilometers. Here's some photos I've taken this year. Uh, these were taken up in Yukon. Northwest Territories had a travel ban for non-residents of course, because of pandemic, but uh, the Yukon also offers some opportunities to see uh, the Aurora. And you can see some of those colors here on the left. Uh, there's the, the green 558, and then above it, there's that mixture of nitrogen emissions. On the top right, you can see that very low altitude right in the center, magenta emission from uh, high energy electrons reaching all the way down to 80 kilometers. Those emissions move extremely quickly in person when you see them, whereas the green seems to follow it because its emission half-life in the atmosphere is about 0.7 seconds. And in the bottom right, you can see the red uh, oxygen emissions at a very high altitudes. Uh, sorry, I've got a cat here. I don't know if you can hear any meowing. I'm just gonna put them down next to me. The emissions in the atmosphere and the interaction electrically and magnetically of, of, of the atmosphere and, and uh, the solar wind is something that's under uh, constant research. There's a lot not understood. And even just a few days ago, the C-REx-2 mission launched a uh, sounding rocket, a suborbital rocket that nonetheless goes very high in the atmosphere. And it released barium, strontium, and uh, a type of aluminum uh, as, as sort of trace gases into the atmosphere. And these are used to visually track in three dimensions the motions of the atmosphere uh, at various altitudes. And some of these trace gases are ionized by, by, the, uh, by sunlight, by ultraviolet component of sunlight, and will actually move and be influenced by electric and magnetic fields. And others are neutral. And so that way they can get a good view of, of what's really influencing the upper atmosphere. So the division between space, the upper atmosphere, between 
what, what is fluid dynamics and what is uh, electrically influenced is, is an area under active research. Uh, because Christmas is coming up for the holidays, there may be some people that want to give gifts about the Aurora. These are three that I would recommend. Uh, the Aurora Watchers Handbook on the left by Neil Davis is out of print right now, but is easily obtained secondhand. Uh, and that really is kind of like our RASC handbook in that it goes in an accessible way, really in depth about what the Aurora are and what we understand about them. It was written some time ago, but the content still stands. In terms of a more storytelling perspective, there's uh, Melanie Windrich, who is a plasma physicist who wrote the uh, Aurora in Search of the Northern Lights. And this is uh, more in the style of a, a travel journal where she interviews uh, many experts and Aurora chasers to understand their relationship with the, the Aurora. And that's a, a very good read. And if you just want to sit down in front of the TV and watch a documentary, um, The Wonder of the Northern Lights by Nature of Things uh, actually speaks to a lot of the Canadian experts and personalities in Aurora chasing both citizen scientists and the researchers because Canada is one of the main uh, contributors to Aurora research, both in instrumentation and in uh, science. So let's talk about the relationship between citizen scientists and Aurora research. And that relationship has very much grown over the last few years. I guess all humans are citizen scientists. We're all curious. Uh, and, and we mix with that the idea that Canada really is an, a rural observatory. There isn't a place quite like it anywhere else. And this was understood as far back as 1957. The International Geophysical Year was the first international, the first big post war international uh, collaboration internationally to, to understand what is going on with. Uh, with the magnetosphere, the ionosphere, and Canadian citizen scientists were given uh, given these these pads to draw on to report auroral sightings, and these were these were compiled. Uh, these were actually mailed to Ottawa as one of the main centers, and they're put into IBM punch cards and turned into synoptic auroral maps, which. Uh, sort of took the place of, of satellite overpasses, which of course hadn't happened at that point. And one of our members of Ottawa Centre, Martin Potter, actually was participating in this and sent me his original blank pad of aurora reports like you see in the centre there. So I'd like to thank him for helping me in the research in this. So in you know, Canadians and specifically a RASC member from, uh, from Ottawa have participated in aurora research uh, for decades. The, the modern version of this is Aurorasaurus, which allows, uh, allows you to report your auroral sightings either through tweets or through posting their website, and those are mapped uh, in conjunction with other information. So that same citizen science observation reporting continues to this day. And of course, citizen scientists like the Alberta Aurora Chasers and the Calgary Rask Center uh, we're, we're central in understanding a new phenomena associated with the aurora, but not the aurora, which is they called Steve, and it became a, a documentary called Chasing Steve, which received a, a, a really high visibility and, and really cemented the idea that aurora chasing is citizen scientist because of the quality of the imagery and the reporting. And this resulted, th these types of imagery resulted in several papers. These are from, uh, from that same analysis of Steve, in this case, the picket fence of green and analyzing what is this picket fence of green you can see on the left and using multiple images from multiple photographers to triangulate altitude and position. Uh, I've, I've also been, uh, happy to work with the University of Calgary, which is central in rural imaging, to contribute some of my own software that I developed to their uh, Aurora X program, which brings together a vast amount of data captured from their permanently installed cameras and other systems across Canada. And really, when you have that much data, a big part of citizen scientists or citizen science contribution doesn't have to be capturing the imagery. It can actually be uh, 
finding a way to sort it, visualize it, and allow people to share it. So citizen scientists uh, can contribute based on their own strengths, whether it's uh, you know speaking speaking to a grade six class, whether it's organizing vast amounts of open data, or whether it's going out and grabbing the imagery themselves. If we get back to my motivation for the Aurora camera, uh, my experience of Aurora chasing as, as, a, as an enthusiast and then working with these researchers is that I understood that both teams want novel image data because those are the clues to new phenomena. Uh, the Aurora really are the footprint of the solar wind and of the vastly complex electromagnetic interactions in the solar system. And we need to understand it. There's a lot of a lot to learn yet. Uh, but both researchers and Aurora chasers want to see something new and they want to see something amazing in their image data. Uh, the chasers we're not out there to catch, you know, specifically calibrated data. Um, we're there to catch something dramatic that maybe we personally have never seen before, like this image from uh, from uh, Kluani Lake up in Yukon that I caught a few years ago, which I just thought was amazing because of the sort of magneto hydrodynamic uh, swirling effect of the auroral curtains when they start to twist on themselves. Uh, would a scientist find that novel or an intriguing? Maybe not, uh, but I found it personally very interesting. On the other hand, the researchers have over the decades in Canada and in conjunction with international partners put research cameras up in the auroral zone. Here's an example of one from the Themis project, which has been running for over a decade. And you can see there's a camera dome, a very sturdy aluminum chassis, uh, GPS radio transmitters. These, in, these uh, pro programs are millions of dollars and a huge amount of effort to design custom software to get auroral imagery. With these all sky cameras that they use, they're, they're arranged in a, a coordinated network so that the imagery can be reprojected to get a full view of auroral activity when all the camera images are stitched together. Uh, this can also be combined with satellite overpasses and the data they receive from particles and from uh, magnetic readings to get a full picture of uh, get a full picture of, of what's going on top to bottom. And so it's the synthesis of instrumentation that helps. Uh, you don't need a big instrument to get information. This is a uh, motion from north to south 900 kilometers that shows the rings, uh, a ring format that was seen right around Thanksgiving. And this is all cell phone imagery tied together from different Facebook posts. They were all tagged at 10, 15 PM. And if you arrange them, you can move about a hundred times faster than the space station and see the same formation from various angles. So citizen scientist doesn't need a good camera. They just need to be in the right place at the right time. So I thought, what if we give the Aurora Chasers a portable all-sky camera station? Uh, we get sort of an adaptive mosaic uh, that is smart about gathering interesting Aurora data. And this is sort of what I came up with, the idea of having a camera case with a camera in it, fully self-contained, uh, that would have GPS location and timestamp, raw images, time-lapse movies, and kiograms could be captured with this, the camera inside. And we could Wi-Fi download and do some remote, uh, remote management. Uh, this would also use off-the-shelf components and a standard consumer camera. So by having standardized components, we could start uh, perhaps giving the Aurora chasers uh, equipment that's repeatable and that they could use for more science-oriented imagery while they capture their own uh, images uh, using their own camera systems. This is done using a fisheye lens. Uh, so we can capture the whole sky at once. And, and this allows us to, Aurora can be completely overhead or just in one, one sector of the sky. And if we capture, uh, if we capture this fisheye perspective, we can always reproject and use it for VR, or YouTube 360, or reproject any uh, smaller, or any smaller field of view from a different kind of lens. So 
this is what the research cameras use, and this is what I chose to use for Aurora. And here's some imagery captured from an Aurora test up north, and you can see a substorm onset in an all sky view moving from the south, coming straight overhead, and then dispersing across the sky. And the horizon, of course, is all around you. And the straight up is in the middle of the image. This is captured at about one frame every two seconds, which is a good target rate for doing time lapse imagery for Aurora motion. Uh, here's something you can do with a fisheye lens. You can reproject it just like the inside of a planetarium dome and then look around virtually as if you were there. So there's the opportunity for, for outreach uh, using that kind of information. This is time lapse information from uh, the Aurora Max camera in Yellowknife, which is run by the University of Calgary. And it's reprojected in one of my uh, tools that I collaborated with them on. That same fisheye imagery can also be converted into keyograms, which are a slice north to south of the central image view. And that kind of gives you an idea at a glance of what the entire night's activity looked like, kind of like, uh, kind of like monitoring an earthquake with little squiggles. Um, from a seismogram, this is, this is uh, the equivalent, but with light. So you can quickly see how the light has moved north and then moved south again. So this kind of data is valuable and can take on many formats for both uh, ease of view and also ease of access so that you can quickly sort many nights and see where the activity was. So this camera I wanted to design should be portable and self-contained and travel friendly because there's a lot of travel associated with Aurora uh, capture. So this is a picture of it sitting in an airplane just underneath where my feet are. It should, there, there's a size limitation there. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, building this Aurora camera and then finally a trip report. At a budget of around $1,000 per unit and I wanted to basically get everything from Amazon you know, off the shelf components, especially pandemic friendly. I started with an off the shelf Canon mirrorless camera, which are very compact, but they have a very large high sensitivity 24 megapixel sensor. Uh, third party manual focus fisheye lenses with 180 degree field of view are now available for a very reasonable price. And this one is an F2 lens from a company called Mikey. Of course, because this camera is gonna be all out all night with you capturing the Aurora, we have an external battery pack uh, that's much bigger than the smaller battery in the camera. And we need a computer to control this. I, I want to be using my own photography equipment and I want Aurora to uh, do its own thing autonomously. So that requires it to do some thinking, some image management, and also some networking and image processing. So I chose a Raspberry Pi because they're inexpensive and can do the job and they can be uh, loaded with Python software. And finally, there's additional sensors you may want to integrate. Uh, temperature monitoring to, to check the health of your system. Uh, auto leveling or, or an indication of level to make sure you're pointed right at the zenith. And maybe some other instruments like uh, humidity or, uh, or a compass to make sure you're pointing north. And these all come in uh, standard, easily purchased uh, small boards that, that each have a sensor capability and can be tied to the Raspberry Pi via its very flexible interface. Uh, so it's really like working with digital Lego, uh, adding these sensors to this system. And of course, there is a lot of wiring to bring this all together. Uh, as an aside, why not just use a planetary camera? Why use, uh, why use a consumer off-the-shelf Canon camera? Uh, for example, this one has an APS-C sensor and it's an RGB filter. And the trouble with that is that the cost is much higher. You can buy those Canon cameras off of eBay or even new for under $500. Uh, but this was much more. Um, and also, I'm just not familiar with working with it where I am familiar working with the Canon cameras. And maybe this is a future direction to use something like a planetary camera where we have more flexibility over uh, frame control and imaging. So here's the exterior of the camera. You'll notice it's in a hard shell case because they're already waterproof, have easy access, have a handle, and they're inexpensive. So there's no need to fabricate a new custom case. The camera sort of points out of the top. There's a weather resistant dome held on by magnets, which I've chosen not to use because the plexiglass there can degrade the image significantly. And usually you're not out when it's 
when there's precipitation anyways. And then a very simple interface uh, with a few control buttons on the side, basically to set up and start the unit. Inside there's a GPS because it's very important to get calibrated imagery. You want to uh, make sure you have longitude, latitude, and timestamp associated with every image you, you capture in order to make a time lapse that's uh, useful for, for science and analysis later on. The camera is mounted on a simple rail system with aluminum channel. Uh, and that's very inexpensive too, and can just be fabricated with, can just be fabricated with hand tools. And there's also an accelerometer mounted to the camera, which allows you to make sure it's pointed at the zenith. In the bottom of the case, there's the lithium ion batteries, uh, the Raspberry Pi control and uh, charging management. Uh, after building the prototype, the first thing I realized was this thing's really big and it's, I can't put it with my camera equipment. It kind of is my camera equipment. I was able to store other camera equipment inside it. It was just too big. So I thought I'd apply Moore's law and shrink it down dimensionally by a factor of two. And so I came up with a new version, uh, version two, which is almost the exact size of an uh, old fashioned lunchbox and everything just barely fit. Uh, I was also able to take a cue from the airport, which has high, you know Wi-Fi hotspots and thought, well, maybe this thing should have a Wi-Fi hotspot too, so that you can monitor what images it is taking while you're out in the field. So you can actually uh, join its network, even though you may have no internet connection where you're capturing the Aurora and just look at what images are coming off of it using your phone. And if you had a star party, for example, of an Aurora party, you could have many people logged in at the same time while looking at the imagery as they're being captured. Because of course the camera sees a lot more than the human eye does in terms of sensitivity. There's also uh, the idea of putting in a very high sensitivity magnetometer in there since magnetic activity is closely associated with auroral activity. So that's sort of the peanut butter hardware, but what about the uh, software chocolate? They, they really go together. And the, the, the software is a big part of, of working with hardware, of course, and I was working with some open source software, but it involved quite a bit of uh, software development from scratch. There's nothing off the shelf that I found was suitable for, for controlling the camera, making it do time lapses autonomously. Uh, fortunately, there's an open source project called the GPhoto project, which allows the USB control of many types of consumer cameras. And uh, I'd encourage you to play with it. You can actually use just use it in the command line to control your own camera if you wanted to. Uh, it, it's very empowering to work with. Um, and in this case, we're interacting with the camera using this G photo library. In order to calibrate the camera, I wanted to make sure that it, its timing and location were as expected. So I, I chose a pass of the International Space Station over Ottawa and set up the Aurora camera out on the balcony to see if it would capture the expected time and location of the ISS. And it did, you can see the track there passing overhead. Uh, one thing to note was that this is a multi-frame exposure, but because of the way the software is written, there's very little dead time between exposures. And you can see that as a, as a little notch in the track of the ISS. And that's something you wanna do with the, the fast motion of the Aurora. You don't wanna have dead time where you're downloading or processing frames. You want the, the camera capturing images as often as possible. And so having a high duty cycle on the shutter uh, is demonstrated here. And that's a, a trait that we want. So that's what I sort of chose to build. And, and you know, the, the big part of that is, is testing it. So this September, uh, we went up to the Yukon and, uh, and gave it a test in a few locations. Uh, getting to the Yukon during the pandemic is fortunately not too difficult. Uh, you can fly WestJet to uh, Calgary and then take, um, I believe it was, it was uh, Air North up to uh, up to Whitehorse. And from there, it's pretty easy to rent a car and drive as far north as the Arctic Circle uh, and, and Dawson City. Dawson City is very interesting. It's about five hour drive north of, of Whitehorse, but there's a beautiful 
a hill just above town called Midnight Dome with a 360 view. It's above the fog that appears in the river valley. And I chose to set up there for a test. Uh, the Aurora just goes on a standard camera tripod and it's got a very small interface that essentially shows an artificial horizon that allows you to level it and point it to the zenith. And then you just press the start button and it begins autonomously gathering time-lapse in imagery for the rest of the night and, and uh, tagging that with the appropriate GPS timestamps, location, and other information. Uh, that allows you to do other things. Aurora chasing is, is about capturing as many images as possible because of the uh, fast changes in aurora activity. It's, it's anything can happen, it seems. So while it was running in the background, I was able to use my own camera, speak with other people that were also there doing their uh, Aurora chasing. And because Aurora was on a two meter high tripod, it wasn't uh, affected by things like car headlights or by uh, headlamps or any other light pollution. Uh, so it could just work and do its thing while I was enjoying capturing the Aurora with my other camera equipment. That's sort of the whole point is, these Aurora chasers are out there to capture imagery with their own expensive cameras that they've saved up for. And if you're asking them to bring a, a kind of citizen science grade instrument with them, you don't want, you don't want it uh, causing a lot of friction with their existing workflow. Uh, you just want them to set it up and let it go. And, and the easier it is to use, the more people will use these cameras and the more data they can collect. The images are then offloaded via Wi-Fi, uh, and it and when you get home, you just plug the Aurora into a USB charger, kind of like a phone. And you can see some data here. We captured 900 images in two different exposure settings, sort of a very fast mode for active Aurora and a slower mode for less active Aurora. I'll just play a quick video here of one of those time lapses. This is a an auroral substorm coming up from the south to overhead. And then the substorm kind of uh, dissipates over time. And you can see some of that red, a lot of the green, and also the magenta colors that are that we described earlier. Later on in the evening, at a different exposure setting, the previous one was at about two second exposures. The, the morning sector of Aurora tend to be very characteristically different with pulsations, almost like zebra stripes, that are a bit more subtle. And so the exposure time was raised to 30 seconds to capture that more subtle activity. So morning sector aurora and, and evening sector aurora tend to behave differently, require different exposure settings. And this demonstrates that the aurora can sort of handle both. This is all the way to dawn. And finally, five hours south in Whitehorse, which is sort of just below the Aurora. Uh, you can see them predominantly in the north. It was a very dark night. You can see the galaxy overhead, some, some clouds and light pollution from the city of, of Whitehorse. But when that clears, you can see the Aurora up north. And then you can see the pulsation and that sort of uh, that broken up aurora of the morning sector before sunrise. So all these phenomena are captured with aurora. And I was doing my own photography or even sleeping and I just come out in the morning and gather up the camera and it would do this capture for me. It also captures raw imagery, which of course has a higher dynamic range, a higher bit depth. So you can do more post-processing to it. For example, this is a single frame from the time-lapse that you just saw. And you can see more of that red aurora that occurs above the green aurora as well as some pillars of of structure in the north. Here's another still frame of the aurora right overhead. And then one that I showed earlier where you can see the, uh, the magenta of that lower altitude molecular nitrogen being uh, excited by the higher, higher energy electrons. And of course you can compress that dynamic range into something that fits on a screen a bit better. So you can see both the dimmer aurora and the brighter within the same, uh, the same image with some uh, sort of dynamic range compression. So there's a lot of post-processing options. Here's just a panoramic from Midnight Dome uh, showing the aurora on a tripod uh, and also the, 
the fog banks in the valley there. It's a really intriguing place to go to Midnight Dome. Uh, and and it, it seems like an ideal place for, for photography. Uh, some of the other images I caught were, were not associated with Aurora directly, but that's sort of the whole point is that while it's capturing its imagery, you can do your own creative photography like this uh, north to the south overhead panoramic across the galaxy that I sort of wrapped into a polar coordinates donut and then just some more standard imagery. Jeremy, we've got this a question the, here. Um, one of the, uh, Andrew's asking, do you use a lens warmer? Uh, in this, these tests, I did not use a lens warmer. Um, I'd love to understand more about that from, from members who have used them. Uh, so far, I haven't encountered any lens fogging up north when capturing imagery, and maybe that's because it's so cold and so dry, but that's an area that I'm not familiar enough with to understand. Uh, there is warmers inside the unit to keep the battery pack uh, warm, uh, but that's sort of a, a solving a slightly different problem. So I'd love to understand more about their applications and, and how they could help in this. Uh, I haven't had any lens fogging issues though in this in this application. Yeah, we tend to use it for, for do. That tends to be where we use those. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I'd love to understand a bit more about that and how it could be implemented. And, and certainly um, having a large battery would help with, with uh, if, if there does need to be a heater in, in some application. Uh, one element that I'd like to eventually take the Aurora Dome or the Aurora is a video capture. And you can see some video here that I captured in Yellowknife in 2018. The motion of the Aurora is very much uh, almost fluidic, I guess, and it can be very rapid. Um, and a time-lapse imagery will capture some of that, but you can also see that a time-lapse image of even a two-second exposure will exhibit some smearing compared to what you're actually seeing. So a future direction might be that it can switch into a video mode if there's a lot of activity. One thing we noticed is that we caught plenty of meteors uh, in these images. I haven't, I haven't gone out and sort of assembled it all, but this seems to make a good meteor capture camera because it's seeing everything. And it's out all night, even if you're not. Uh, going back to the heating, the, the Raspberry Pi actually makes a great five watt heater just because it's a computer that's consuming energy. And in the small volume of the case, that, that seems to keep the batteries warm enough. The next thing I want to do is I've purchased uh, equipment to make more of these units and I want to get them into the hands of other Aurora chasers so we can really start leveraging the idea of having multiple units in the hands of people that are going out and capturing Aurora at the same time, maybe on the same night. Uh, and you can see these units being assembled here on the right. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work to do with software, of course. Um, once you have the hardware, the software really defines what you can do or can't do. And making Aurora smarter, since it is autonomous, would be a key thing. Uh, having it change its camera settings based on what it's seeing seems to be a good path forward in, in capturing better imagery. So as, as the Aurora sort of heat up and get more interesting and have more motion and more intensity, it can dynamically change the exposure. Uh, of what it's capturing. That's, that's sort of the direction I want to go next. And there's also a lot of website deployment in terms of offloading the imagery and putting in a central location to share with other people. Um, the reason I'd like to use a magnetometer eventually is sort of captured in this short video. You can see on the left, a uh, magnetometer co-located with a uh, with the Aurora Max camera. And as you start seeing perturbations in the magnetic field, you also see the onset of, of uh, an auroral substorm. So the magnetic observatory and the visual observatory go hand in hand with aurora uh, observation. And you could even maybe use the magnetometer to, for example, control the exposure. If you start seeing magnetic uh, perturbations, you could maybe ramp up the camera to take faster images or, or uh, uh, shorter exposures. So thanks for your time. Uh, um, 
you can follow the progress on a Twitter account I've called Capture North. And, and I hope to also get some feedback from people with far more experience in instrument development and, and uh, night photography. Uh, I'm very much open to feedback in, in how to make an instrument like this more useful, more robust, and, and uh, more fun to use. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was fascinating. Um, are there any questions for him that have not been asked already? If so, please type them in the Q&A. Um, somebody said you may already have a lens more recent seat from the computer will slightly heat the camera and its lens. That may be enough. Have you used an infrared temperature measurement tool? Ah, that's very interesting. Um, infrared would certainly be uh, useful. Um, uh, so far, I've been using something called a DH11, which is, uh, as I was saying, a lot of the sensors in the in the maker community that, that are sort of built around these single board computers like the Raspberry Pi. Along with that came a lot of very easy to use sensors. And one of the common ones that does temperature and humidity uh, is called the DH11. And that one is basically a thermocouple. And the reason I liked it is it had a humidity sense as well. And my thought was, even though I don't understand much about uh, uh, dew and lens fog, that combination of detecting the, the relative humidity and temperature at the same time would allow me to know when to maybe turn on a lens heater. Uh, so, uh, but infrared, I haven't uh, tried yet. Mostly I wanna keep the lithium ion batteries from getting too cold because uh, they really need to be above zero degrees Celsius to operate efficiently and they can be uh, damaged if you try and charge them, if you bring them in from the cold and they're below zero. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. And uh, we'll just switch the spotlights here. There we go. Okay, we're gonna have a quick five minute break. Uh, we'll resume at nine o'clock. Um, here is your M last M&M challenge. And here it is. We'll see you in five.
Got about uh, one minute to go, folks, and then we will resume. Okay, uh, Chris, we can move on to the next slide. Here is the uh, answers to the M&M challenge. So uh, hopefully you're able to uh, guess some of those. So we're gonna move on to our observation reports. We have quite a few observations this evening. So here's the order. I'm gonna ask that our observers please be as brief as humanly possible. And I'm gonna start off with, uh, with Oscar. Just let me highlight you there, spotlight you there, Oscar. There we go. All righty. All right. So this is uh, my image of uh, CED214, uh, uh, which is an H2 region in Cepheus. Uh, I took this image over two nights, uh, I think October 5th and 6th, when we had a stretch of, of good skies there. Uh, it's about 12 and a half hours of exposure uh, in five minutes of exposures. I uh, used a ZWOASI 533MC Pro for this one uh, through a, a short refractor, a Skywatcher Equinox uh, 80ED. Um, yeah, so this is a star forming region. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the question mark nebula. There's a there's another circular um, nebula just, just out of the field of view of this. Uh, you'd, you'd see in a, in a shorter focal length scope that makes it look like a question mark. It's kind of cool. I wish I would have captured it, but didn't quite have the focal length for it. Um, but yeah, no, this is a, it was a fun image to take. I haven't, I haven't done uh, imaging with, with my refractor in a long time. So it was, uh, it was, it was good to image with it and, uh, fun to, to, uh, to take an image with, uh, with equipment that's a little bit more forgiving than my Ashmit Casper. Uh, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just had to bring uh, Robert Dick in here to talk to his images. He, uh, you are able to talk if you unmute yourself there, Rob. So, uh, Robert, are you there? Okay, well, these these are uh, Robert's images. Uh, he was the first one to get us in the images uh, from the lunar eclipse. And uh, he's uh, one at 348 and the other one at uh, 358. And uh, it was a bit of a challenge, certainly in our area with the, with the cloud cover. So uh, thank you, Robert, for that. And uh, we'll move on then to the next uh, uh, presentation. So Tom, just give me a second here. Well, I uh, bring you up and there you are. There, All right. live. Here we go. Uh, first, I have to apologize to everybody for the terrible cloudy skies we've been having. I built my observatory this summer, so it's my fault. Sorry. Um, using that uh, observatory, I'll, I'll say I'm still basically at what I would consider to be first light stage. I've got a GSO RC10 truss with an ASI 6200 uh, off-axis guider and um, EFW7 filter wheel. So I've been capturing a few images. This is a triangulum. This is just uh, 10 30-second subs uh, put together. And... Um, processed through Photoshop. 
Uh, if you want to go on to the next one. This is M31. This is uh, just 20 30 second subs um, with the same setup. So CCD inspector showing that the optics are in pretty good alignment. Collimation is good. There's quite a bit of field curvature. GSO doesn't publish their flatness specs, if you want to put it that way, for this telescope. So nobody really seems to know. I've searched quite a bit online. Um, but CCD inspector shows the curvature and my flattener is supposed to arrive on Monday. So we'll see what happens. Next one. There's uh, M42. This is, these are all captured on uh, November 27th, by the way. Uh, so Orion was uh, not quite uh, very high in the southern sky yet. This is pretty much still in the eastern sky. But I've always liked uh, capturing images of Orion. So really, this is the first stacked image that I've had with this setup. And uh, the quality is looking quite good, actually, I think. Next one. And uh, a quick image of Polaris again. This is 10 30 second subs. Um, uh, these are all done with the ASI 6200 model uh, camera using the Optolong LRGB filters. I also have the uh, Optolong L Pro Extreme. And I tend to like using the images from that filter for the luminance when stacking things or when putting the image together in Photoshop. It, seems to give me better results than the luminance filter does. So I capture all of them and then uh, choose either luminance or the L-Pro at the end of the process. So hopefully, like I said, the flattener is supposed to arrive on Monday. So there will be a whole setup process going through that and getting everything back in focus. And I'll redo a lot of these images, run them through CCD inspector and uh, see what the changes are. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Okay, so I will start off with my moon eclipse uh, sequence. This is the lunar eclipse. This was with a 400 millimeter lens, a crop sensor Nikon DSLR. And I did end up putting my camera on a tracker. And the when the moon was fully eclipsed, I had to go about two seconds. Um, tracked to get a bright image of the moon. And this was, of course, shot between clouds. So we were a bit lucky. Next, please. This is a California Nebula, NGC 1499. It's a very, very large emission nebula in Perseus. This was shot with a Red Cat 51 and the ASI 2600 uh, color camera. And I did about two hours and with an L enhanced filter, which is a dual band um, narrow band filter. Next. And this was another attempt um, to get the moon, the eclipse moon with the, Ple uh, the, yeah, the Pleiades. The trick here is of course, you had to expose uh, enough to catch the stars, but not so much as to blow out the moon, which was pretty difficult to do. And in the end, I had to blend an exposure of the moon taken right after the exposure of the stars. This, I threw a different camera on the tracker and this was an 85 millimeter lens with a full frame uh, Nikon DSLR. And no matter what I did, I was blowing out the moon. So I, I did my best. I've had about eight seconds and I caught a little bit of stars. Next. And this is um, where my imaging has gone a bit crazy. This is a Cedarblad 214, similar to the one shown by Oscar, but this is a wider angle. And so we can see the arc that um, if you turn this image sideways, actually it does look like a question mark. This is a narrow band image. It was shot with, um, actually I began this project with RGB image of this nebula and it's, it's very pretty and it's very pink and it's actually right behind me. And then I added oxygen and then I added hydrogen and then I ended up, I thought I might as well go and do sulfur. So it is in the Hubble palette and it's about 28 hours because I, I did oxygen twice by accident. Next please. 
This is actually, this is the same nebula in RGB. And as you can see, it's very pink without the narrow band images, but it has a beautiful star color, which I just love. Um, so I ended up taking the RGB stars and I put it in the narrow band image. Next, please. Another one of my narrow band images, this is the elephant trunk. If you, I, if you shoot the elephant trunk in RGB only, it is very pink. And it is one of the nebulas that really is quite pretty when you do a narrow band uh, Hubble palette because there is such a large section of oxygen in the center. And that is the blue part. And you can see the dark nebula um, structures. They sort of stand out quite a bit against the blue. But it is tricky to find a color palette that is nice. Uh, it, it looks a bit wild. And, and hopefully one day I'll, I'll make them look a little calmer. But that's it. Those are my um, images. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'm going to turn over to Richard Taylor. Okay, well, uh, as you uh, saw from the award that I got earlier, I'm always up for a challenge. So uh, this is the first, the beginner challenge for November, um, M30, a globular cluster. Um, I, I thought I would be able to find the, uh, the challenges this month. They seem to be fairly straightforward, but the first opportunity I had was uh, November 10th. And when I went outside to have a look at the uh, horizon, oh, geez, I, I can't see anything. They've got trees down there. So I packed up all my equipment and drove off to FLO. And while I was driving, the clouds came in. And it was one of those really frustrating evenings where, you know, there's just patchy clouds. So you set up the equipment and you aim for a hole and then a cloud comes over and that kind of thing over and over again. So basically, uh, this is just, I found it. It's not a great image. It was uh, quite a number of pictures were completely spoiled by clouds and the other ones were a little bit blurry. So anyway, there it is, M30. Next one. This was the intermediate challenge. This is NGC 253, the Sculptor Galaxy. And this one fortunately was a little bit out of the cloud. So the same evening, I managed to get quite a good uh, series of pictures of this one. So you've got the uh, dust lanes in it. It's a lovely edge on spiral galaxy. So I was quite happy to get that one. Next please. And then there was the senior challenge, the uh, expert challenge of trying to find globular clusters in uh, the Andromeda galaxy. Now, this one, like the two previous images, are taken with my new camera that I got. It's um, it's really intended for planetary work. It's the ASI 178MC. And so it's got a fairly narrow field of view, even in my uh, short uh, refractor and it doesn't fit the entire uh, galaxy in the field of view. However, it does zoom in on it quite nicely and making use of um, a lovely image I found online by Robert Gendler of the Nighthawk Observatory. He'd identified uh, the locations of quite a number of globular clusters. And so I went star hopping around and said, yeah, yeah, I've actually found a lot of globulars. Now this is um, a cropped in view as well, just to see a little bit of the core and the regions around it. I've sent a uh, picture on for astronauts this month and there's a bigger uh, field of view there with even more uh, of these globular clusters identified. So a uh, very, very, very interesting challenge to, to be able to find you know, globular clusters in a different galaxy millions of light years away. Next one, please. Bingo, all four. This is the uh, lunar challenge. Carpus, sorry, Montes Carpatus, the range of mountains just north of uh, Copernicus. Now, actually, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here. I've uh, recycled a picture that I showed last month of um, the waning moon, that's the one on top, but the uh, lower image is the opposite side lit up on November 13th, so just this last month. 
And it's quite interesting, I found, to, to compare the, the, the lighting on the mountains from the uh, one side and the other side. Then certainly there's one mountain uh, just off to the upper left, which is beyond the Terminator, but the peaks of the mountains are, are lit up by the rising sun. Also the, um, the uh, mountains in the center of the Copernicus are, are really quite interesting to see them lit up with the different lighting conditions. Next one, please. And while I was looking for challenges, it turned out that um, in this one's Sky and Telescope magazine, there was an article by Bob King. This is the December 2021 issue in which he was also focusing on the Andromeda galaxy and saying that he'd found that you can actually identify individual stars within the Andromeda galaxy. And so he actually showed a map of how you could star hop from M110, that little fuzzy spot just above Andromeda's core in this picture. So the next picture zooms in on that location and shows the star hopping that Bob King suggested going from uh, M110 to a little diamond shaped pattern of stars and then heading along the long axis of the diamond to the next bright star and then up towards another sort of orangey colored star with a cluster around it. And very close to that, there's a little equilateral triangle. And what I'm pointing to right there is a star, a single star in the Andromeda galaxy. It has a very obscure name. I won't try and read it out loud, it's there on the screen, but it's uh, got a visual magnitude of 15.6. So I thought that was pretty impressive that I could take a picture of that with some very simple equipment, a, a William Optics Z73 refractor telescope, a planetary camera, as I said, and it's from my Ottawa backyard. So I believe that's something like Bortle 8, really light polluted. So quite amazing. Thank you. That's all for me. Okay, thank you, Richard. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim Sophia. Just a second here. There you go, Jim. Okay, thank you, uh, Dave. So recently I purchased a small refractor from William Optics, a 61 millimeter aperture with a focal reducer and a field flattener running at uh, f4.7, which gives me a wide field of view, about three and a half by two and a half degrees with my camera setup. So I've selected four deep sky objects to show you, which would be suitable for this size. Exposure time for all images is three and a half minutes using live stacking with the Mallinckam Sky Radar camera and software. To deal with city light pollution, I use the IDEAS NBX dual pan filter to enhance the contrast with hydrogen alpha and oxygen three emission lines. Some light post-processing using Topaz Studio was done afterward. So right now you're looking at the California Nebula, an emission nebula in Perseus. It's a thousand light years away and approximately a hundred light years long. Its length is two and a half degrees or five full moons wide from our perspective. This image was recently taken off my north balcony during a clear night in Ottawa, which we do get once in a while. Next one, please. Uh, this is the Hart Nebula, IC1805 in Cassiopeia. It's an emission nebula showing glowing ionized hydrogen gas and darker dust lanes. It's 7,500 light years from Earth, and it's quite large, with a radius of 165 light years and an apparent dimension of two and a half by two and a half degrees. The Hart Nebula was discovered by William Herschel in November of 1787. Next one, please. And only one degree away from the Hart Nebula is the Sol Nebula, designated as Sharpless 2-199, also an emission nebula in, in Cassiopeia. And this is a vast star forming region containing clouds of dust and gas, 
which are illuminated by the light of surrounding young stars. And you should be able to see some small open clust star clusters in this nebula. Next one, please. The North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula fill my field of view very nicely. These little refractors take a nice wide portion of the sky. And so I'm hoping to catch the Orion Nebula next from the south balcony, though with the position of my neighbor's tree, it'll be late at night before it's visible. Nevertheless, I'm aiming to, to uh, image the Orion and the Running Man Nebula in one capture. So we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm going to turn it over to Taras. Thanks. Um, so th these are pictures from lunar eclipse, which we had uh, in the night from November 18th to November 19th. This was the longest partial lunar eclipse since February 18th, 1440, and the longest until February 8th, 2669. So we enjoyed it uh, on quite a span of time from between uh, 2, no, 3.20 p, uh, a.m. until late, uh, almost like until 5 o'clock, until practically dawn time. However, the clouds, as always, came in after 4 o'clock and then they went away, but uh, it was still mostly clouded after the second phase. This is the picture of almost totality. So this was not a full lunar eclipse. Uh, it, the, lun uh, sorry, the, the moon was 97% covered by the shadow uh, or rather uh, semi-shadow. Um, and there is a little bit of, little bit of uh, uh, illuminated uh, nim uh, limb on the left side, as you can see on this picture. However, this picture is a little bit overexposed, and uh, I did it on purpose just to show uh, the bright color. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, my bad. The previous picture was the what we saw, and this one is, uh, this one is overexposed, and uh, I uh, did it on purpose so, so that you could see the stars uh, around, because it was already quite dark. With the long exposure, we were we were able to see this glow uh, on this illuminated edge and uh, the stars as uh, they proceeded. Uh, rather, the moon was actually moving with regard to them, as we saw it developing within the span of uh, uh, hours. And if you go to the next picture, this is actually the process. So this was taken at uh, 320 a.m. and uh, as the shadow was ingressing and covering uh, the moon, I increased the exposure a little bit for consecutive shots to see how the color of the moon changes and how it became uh, red uh, at almost totality. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Taras. Uh, just give me a second here. And <laughs> Well, good evening. Uh, what a month we came, come off. Um, in the month of November, I had 18 observing nights, and 11 of those were in the first half of the month. I only missed, I think, four nights in the, uh, in the first half of the month. Um, so uh, if you can start this, Chris, it's uh, an animated... Uh, Jeff, nope. Maybe it's not going to work. Well, that's too bad. Anyway, um, Sorry, Jupiter. I was unaware that it was an animated GIF, and no, it's not working for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this is from back in September. Uh, Jupiter's been uh, past its uh, opposition for a little while now. And uh, I decided I, I need to get some good images of it. And this is pretty much the best I've managed. Um, this is with the, the Boltwood 16 inch scope. The unfortunate thing is uh, Jupiter is very, very far south right now. And the way my trees line up, the only place I can actually see the planet is when it's right over the roof of the house. 
so the seeing is uh, is not generally very good but uh, this is about the best set of uh, images i've got um, maybe sometime again we'll try it as a, as an animation um uh, but this is the only one I've got with the red spot in it, and I thought it was it was the prettiest of the bunch. Uh, next, please. So this is the the Christmas tree cluster in celebration of the uh, the coming season. Uh, if you can't see the uh, Christmas tree, the brightest star in the center is the trunk of the tree, and then the brightish bluish stars that uh, lead in a triangle off to the right are the, uh, the tree itself. And up at the tip of the tree, instead of an angel, we have the cone nebula. So this is about uh, two and a half hours of exposure with uh, Canon 60DA on the uh, 10 inch F4 Schmidt Newtonian. Uh, next. So our challenge, our advanced challenge for this month, I, I also did NGC 50, 253, but uh, we're only allowed five pictures. So um, as part of the challenge, I decided I wanted to try and image uh, some of the globulars, uh, again with the 10 inch F4 Schmidt Newtonian and the Canon 60DA. Uh, but I decided as long as I was gonna image the galaxy, I might as well do it all. So I started shooting a nine panel mosaic and I got seven panels done. These are, this is what, uh, this is about five of them or four of them. Uh, so after I got seven panels done, uh, I took the camera out to shoot the eclipse and it died partway through the eclipse and no longer runs. So I'm dead in the water for finishing this panel probably until next year. However, if we go to the next slide, this is the uh, sort of the south, uh, southwest end of the galaxy. Um, all the, uh, the globulars that are detectable are uh, marked with little red circles. So there's 22 of them on this image. The uh, brightest area in the galaxy down to the lower left is NGC 206 which is a, a big star forming area and cluster in, in Andromeda. And next picture, and this is uh, further up the side, you can see NGC 110 down to the left. And there's another 22 globulars. Um, and interestingly, five of them are actually globulars around M110. M110 is kind of interesting because it's uh, it's a small dwarf elliptical galaxy, but you can see uh, that the the outer limits of the galaxy are actually twisted. It's got quite a significant torque on it from its uh, interaction with M31. So that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Rick. We're gonna turn it over to uh, Jim. Just a second here. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for various reasons, I haven't had a lot of opportunities this fall to do any observing. Uh, basically, September, October, and beginning of November, I didn't get out at all. But that changed the latter half of November with two splendid observing sessions, one on the 22nd and the other just recently on the 27th. And all of the images I have tonight were captured during those two sessions. Going backwards chronologically, this first image is of the Learn Lunar Observing Challenge for November, the uh, Carpathian Mountains. The Terminator was well positioned on the 27th to really highlight this area just north of Crater Copernicus. The mountain range is about 360 kilometers long and has peaks towering up to about 3000 meters above the surrounding terrain. The range itself forms the southwest rim of the Imbrium impact basin. This particular image was captured using a 10 inch Ritchie Chrétien scope at its native F8, an ASI 183 monochrome camera, and an astronomic Pro Planet 642 IR pass filter. It's a stack of the best 200 frames out of 3000 
with wavelets applied in Registax 6. Uh, next image, please, Chris. The bulk of the evening on the 27th was actually spent doing observing of deep sky objects. It was an opportunity to try out a new filter that I just purchased, an EDAS brand 6.5 nanometer hydrogen alpha filter. I was quite impressed at how well it was able to bring out faint, subtle details in the nebulosity, as shown here in this image of the area in Orion around the flame and the horsehead nebulas. This particular image is a live stack of 20 20 second sub exposures captured using my 98 millimeter William Optics refractor and Mallinckam DS432 monochrome camera. This is a capture of what I was observing live on the screen at the time with no, process, no post processing applied. I was quite happy with the H alpha filters performance, considering that this was taken from my Bortle 9 plus backyard. Next image, please. This next image is of Crater Janssen, which is located in the far eastern side of the moon. It was captured on the night of the 22nd, using the same setup and method as described for the earlier moon image. The Terminator was perfectly positioned on this evening to highlight the intricate details of this heavily worn 201 kilometer diameter crater. I really like the clarity with which the rifts on the crater floor show up in this image. Next image, please. Uh, I think that might be out of order. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, there we go. As on the 27th, the bulk of my time on the 22nd was actually spent observing deep sky objects. It was the first night that I had tr tried out my new H alpha filter. Knowing that the fall sky has many large emission nebulae to explore, I decided to put the filter on a wee 40 millimeter aperture refractor. This particular image of the Hart Nebula in Cassiopeia illustrates the very wide field of view that resulted. This is the raw 30 frame stack of 20 second sub exposures captured with my Mellencam DS432 monochrome camera. No post processing applied. I really enjoy the extra wide field of view, but still crisp images this lens and camera combination is able to provide. Seeing all the nebulosity, both light and dark, that surrounds the heart nebula really helps to put it into perspective. Uh, the next image, please. My final image is of the area in Orion surrounding M42 captured on the same night as the previous images. It clearly shows M42 and the neighboring running man sitting in a vast region of dust and gas. Considering the fact that M42 itself is 12 light years across, this is an inconceivably large volume of material we are looking at, all of which may someday be involved in the formation of new stars. Certainly not in our lifetimes, but perhaps within the lifetime of humans in the distant future. The fact that I am able to observe this dust and gas with an inexpensive inch and a half diameter scope from my heavily light polluted backyard blows my mind. I can't wait to see what other wonders this camera scope filter combination are able to reveal. You can hear me blather more about the virtues of a mini refractor in a talk I am giving in next week's meeting. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That'll be next month's meeting. So great. Thank you. Um, this is M31, and uh, I thought it was the uh, challenge object. So I decided to image it with my. Uh, Teleview refractor, uh, which I had not used for imaging with my new sensor, which is four times the area of my old one. With my old camera, I needed four panels. This is one panel. Uh, so I was, I was uh, pretty interested in trying it. And so I often get asked, how long does it take? How long an exposure is this? And well, 
First of all, it took me 30 hours to get the equipment working. I, I had terrible trouble with uh, the spacing of the uh, fuel flattener and also with tilt of the sensor because it's bigger. So a little bit of tilt makes a big difference. It was, that was a challenge. Um, and then there was no room for any filters. So, the, so I was only able to take a luminosity image. And so having set it all up, I took an 11 hour uh, black and white image of, of the uh, galaxy. And I, I, liked, I liked the end result. So then I uh, whacked on a DSLR, which does color. And then I got another 11 hours of that stuck them together in Photoshop and this was a result, which is uh, not too bad. And then I noticed that it was the globulars in M31 we were looking for, not M31 itself. So I needed a, some, an image with a longer focal length uh, telescope, which I did. I took it with my uh, 12, 12 and a half inch uh, Newtonian. Next image, please. So this is a, a, this, uh, this is a five hour, uh, uh, luminance, red, green, and blue image of the core. And um, as somebody else mentioned, uh, these, these, some of these white dots are, are globular clusters and which freaking dots are they? So I, I got out the star charts and started to star hop and um, next image. Yeah, this is how many, there's uh, over 70 there. Uh, in this uh, in this view of globular clusters. So each of the arrows points at a globular cluster. I like the circle idea actually better. I wish I'd thought of that. Um, now, um, this took a long time. And you know, if I cared more, I would have put numbers on them, but I was burned out after finding them. So I never did number them. Uh, Oscar is basically a evil, evil man for having made this the challenge object. Next image. I had my DSLR mounted on my Teleview refractor, so I aimed it at the comet. And uh, I got this image at uh, 4 a.m. On, uh, on the 27th. And um, uh, I did not get up at 4 a.m. I just stayed up. I don't get up at 4 a.m. Uh, so it turns out though, that when I had my luminosity, just my, uh, my mono camera on, uh, I had taken an image of the comet also a few days before on the 23rd. Go, next image, please. And so by accident, not planned, it, uh, it was going right between the whale and the hockey stick galaxies heading up. Now this is only a luminosity image. Uh, you can see dust motes all over the place. Uh, Anyway, um, sometimes people, you know, they like a little more detail. And so I labeled it for the people who need more detail. Next image, please. And so, um, you know, for the people who believe everything they read on the net, I need to tell you that I'm not totally positive that's a Romulan. It, 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 could, it could be Cardassian or Klingon. I really can't be sure. Next image. I'm sorry, I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bob. So uh, last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Cloninger. Paul, just a second here. I'm going to just use my picture since he's uh, out in the boonies. And uh, there we go, Paul. Uh, thank you, Dave. I appreciate the, uh, the, the picture and the saving of the bandwidth. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, well, I see from our images tonight that at least a few of the night owls who observed the lunar eclipse on November the 19th were treated to clear skies to enjoy the event. Uh, fortunately, uh, some areas in our region were lucky enough to get openings in the clouds just in time for at least part of the show. Unfortunately for me, I tried to predict where it might be clear around the time of maximum and wound up in the wrong place. So I was uh, snookered by the clouds for the first portion of the event and dogged by some variable cloudiness for the remainder. Oh well, sometimes you get the bear and sometimes the bear gets you, but still it was a pretty uh, sight to see and I did manage to get a few shots in. I was using a 300 millimeter uh, Canon lens with a 1.4 times uh, tele-extender uh, for a focal length of 420 millimeters uh, on my Canon uh, EOS RP camera mounted on a stationary tripod. This view, this view was taken through some thinning clouds about 45 minutes after the maximum when the moon was still uh, about 73% uh, in Earth's deep shadow. It was a two second exposure at ISO 800 with an effective aperture of f11. Next one, please, Chris. 
At uh, 51 minutes after maximum, the reddening uh, of that portion of the moon still in the Earth's umbra was, was still apparent visually, although it was decreasing noticeably minute by minute. With more of the moon's surface now under direct sunlight, I had to cut my exposure time down to a quarter of a second to keep the shadowed portion from being overwhelmed by the uneclipsed portion. The clouds were also starting to build uh, back in at this time and gave the moon a bit of an asymmetrical aura. Next one, please. So at uh, 74 minutes after maximum, only 36% of the moon was still in the umbra and uh, was starting to get into some trees at my location. Fast moving clouds also continued to build and, and were, uh, were increasingly being lit up by uh, the, the moon around them. They made for some interesting views though. So, so with the eclipse, with this eclipse uh, only covering a maximum of 97% of the moon's surface and, and with uh, that occurring at 4 a.m. on a cool and partially cloudy November's night, it probably wasn't as enticing of an event to many as a full lunar eclipse under more favorable conditions is. Fortunately, we don't have to wait too long for potentially more favorable conditions and our next chance. On the night of May 15th to 16th next year, a total eclipse will occur with its maximum happening just 11 minutes past midnight on the 16th. We'll have to keep our fingers crossed for some clear skies that night. Next one, please. So a full moon is the only time we can observe a lunar eclipse. And uh, in truth, many observers write off nights of the full moon at other times, since it tends to pretty much overwhelm most other celestial objects. However, the full moon still presents some interesting observational opportunities at these times. I took this image a few months ago when the moon was just four and a half hours shy of its full phase. This was taken with my 70 millimeter stellar view F6 APO and a 1.6 times Barlow lens uh, using uh, the Canon 70D. Even though there is very little shadow detail, the direct on illumination by the sun at full moon brings out many features that are more difficult to see or image at other times. I find that the contrast between the smooth dark mare regions and the heavily cratered uplands is more pronounced at this time. And the full disk allows you to see the maximum extent of prominent ejector rays, especially from young craters like Tycho, seen here near the top. You can also see many more bright white spots dotting the disk at this time, which are smaller, younger craters being directly illuminated. Crater Aristarchus near the four o'clock position here is the brightest spot on the moon and stands up particularly well against the surrounding dark mare of the, oceans, uh, of the ocean of storms at the time of the full moon. But the full moon can also offer some unique views of its polar regions at this phase. I've rotated this view 180 degrees from our usual view and so south is at the top. Notice that e even being nearly full, there's still some shadowed crater detail visible near the upper limb. That's thanks to the amount of southerly lunar libration in latitude uh, on this night of almost six degrees. This means that the moon's south polar regions were tilted towards us by that amount, allowing us to actually glimpse some features technically on the far side. My next slide zooms in on this region at the top and highlights some interesting recent developments here. You may recall the presentations that Jim Thompson and I showed you earlier this year that concentrated on this region due to the interesting formations found here, specifically the Leibniz Mountains, some of the highest on the moon. These mountains are situated within only a few degrees of the lunar south pole and as such are tricky to observe. However, under favorable, favorable conditions of libration and lunar phase, as was the case here, the mountains can be readily observed. Some of the peaks are identified in white here, notably the Leibniz Beta and Malapert Massives. So two weeks ago, NASA announced that this area is now the prime landing location of two lunar probes it intends to send for soft landings and exploration next year and in 2023. The Nova Sea Lander will be targeted to land near Shackleton Crater, which is situated in the shadows just behind the Malapert Massive and is less than one degree of latitude from the lunar south pole. The Viper Lander will follow in 2023 and will land at Nobile Crater in the shadowed region just behind Leibniz Beta Massive, and again, very close to the South Pole. These mis the missions of these two landers are similar. Bo both will be drilling into and sampling the lunar regolith in these locations to see if water is present there, as many researchers believe. The hope is to discover ice within three feet of the surface. 
Both spacecraft are equipped with a meter long drill to obtain samples. The Nova Sea lander also carries two small rovers to explore the area near the landing site. The Viper itself is a, a, is a rover and will head into permanently shadowed craters, some of the coldest spots in the entire solar system, where it is believed water ice reserves may have endured for billions of years. These missions are a prelude to the manned uh, missions uh, of the planned Artemis program, uh, scheduled to touch down in the same area in just a few years after, after these missions. One final note on this image, just beyond the tips of the yellow arrows you see here, you can see a line of mountains right at the lunar limb. These are actually features of the lunar far side and are part of a towering chain of mountains ringing the enormous South Pole Atkin impact basin, which is the largest known impact crater in our solar system. So you're actually peeking over the rim and seeing things on the far side. So if you want to try to observe some of these extreme features yourself, you can consult the monthly observing pages in your observer's handbook to find the dates of maximum lunar uh, latitudinal libration. Positive values indicate when features near the North Pole are most tilted towards us, and likewise negative values indicate the same for the South Polar regions. Next one, please. So finally, uh, I couldn't let December go by with, uh, without one final full moon target for your observing pleasure. So uh, I know I shouldn't have done this because I've blown my limit, uh, but so I, I snuck in these last few images. I showed this a couple of years ago and I still find it amusing every time I put a scope on the full moon. It's the lunar deer. Have a close look, if you don't remember my presentation from a couple of years ago, have a close look at this image and see if you can spot it. It's just near the center and about a one third of the way towards the right limb. It's looking right at you. And the next slide might help your visualization. Chris, if you would, there we go. And Chris, maybe you can flip back and forth between these just a couple of times uh, to, to, to make it obvious. Hey, you weren't supposed to show that one. <laughs> anyway, to observe this feature, you'll probably need to use a neutral density filter to cut down on the brightness of the full moon and give you better contrast between the light and dark areas. The lunar deer, uh-huh, pause. And, and, and so remember, you gotta be nice, not naughty, because as you'll see in my last slide, now you can show that one, Chris, as you can see in my last slide, Christmas is only three weeks away, and this guy's got connections. So safe and happy holidays to you all, and we'll catch you next year. Cheers. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, hang on, let me just turn my video back on. There we go. Okay, so our observing challenges last month, uh, we had MESA 30, MGC 253, Andromeda's Globulars, and Montes Carpatus. And uh, we actually have one person do all, all, all of them. That's amazing. So what do we have upcoming this month? Our Deep Sky Challenge, Beginner Challenge is NGC 2403. Uh, Spiral Galaxy, our intermediate challenge is NGC uh, 1499 in the California Nebula. And our advanced challenge is Palomar 2, a globular cluster. And so these will all be uh, published in our astronauts, so you can uh, refer to them again. And our lunar challenge is Lacos Tamoris and uh, a lunar mare in the southwest region of the moon. There's a summary of the uh, four challenges. So the RASC calendars should arrive soon. Uh, we do have, we did order a few extra. If you're interested, please email secretary at ottawa.rasc.ca. So we're hoping to have them in very shortly. We're just trying to track them down. They should have arrived by now. And uh, for those of you who have ordered them, uh, there's various pickup locations around town that you have selected. Fred Lawson Observatory is open, a limit of 100 people on site outdoors and five people with masks in the observatory. We do have a flow, potential slow, flow star party tomorrow night. Skies are sort of iffy, but we'll leave that to Gordon Webster to make the call on, on that one. Here are the folks that uh, so the folks that keep the uh, the club running here, and uh, you can reach out to any of them if you wish. 
I'm not sure what the numbers were, Chris, but I, I see they were in the uh, mid to high 60s most of the, the time. The maximum I saw was 75, so we were probably over 80 uh, unique people. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. And thank you to everybody who participated here this evening. And thank you for your support over the last, uh, I guess it's been three years I've been meeting chair. And uh, I'm ha quite happy to pass it on to, uh, to Mick, who's going to take over in January. And uh, thank you to all the observers for being brief in their, their observations. We've, we're doing quite well time-wise here. Again, uh, comments or new ideas, meeting chair at ottawa.rasc.ca, where we are currently looking for uh, March, April, May, and onwards for, for presentations. So if you have any ideas or anybody, uh, you're, uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. And if you'd like to join the RISC, regular memberships are $88, family memberships are $82.50, plus $15 for adult, $8.10 per youth. And youth memberships are $53, those under 21 or under 25 if you're still a student. What are the local benefits of being a member of the RESC? Uh, we have the Ted Bean Telescope Loan Library. Once we get back in the museum, we've got an awesome uh, library of books and uh, Estelle looks after that for us. And obviously you have access to the Fred Lawson Observatory out near Almont. And then you also receive Sky News every second month, as well as the journal on sort of uh, every second month. Uh, those of you who are members right now should be receiving your observer's handbook any day now. Uh, it is being delivered differently this year. They're, they're using uh, different uh, couriers to, to drop them off. Um, and uh, I got mine today, so hopefully get yours shortly. And then, of course, we've got our amazing astronauts by our, our local editor, Gordon Webster. This comes out monthly electronically, and he tells me he's going to get it out in a couple of days from now. Next meeting is January the 7th and uh, 7.30 p.m. And again, any ideas or talks, please email meetingchair at ottawa.rasc.ca. And I look forward to seeing Mick up in front of the camera and uh, next month. So thank you, Mick, for uh, putting your hand up to uh, volunteer. Hopefully your arm's not hurting too much from the twisting.